Welcome everyone to Sonic 10. To kick it off, let's look at Happily and Budaya. Welcome everyone to Psych 10. This is the show where you get psyched up, you know, not just psyched up. You get to learn about psychology and always uh, joining me is my co-conspirator and uh, co-host uh, Andrea Chu. Andrea, welcome to the show. And uh, Hello, are you Andrea. psyched for today, uh, Andrea? And, you know, we've got a great yes. show, I think, uh, lined up for you, you know, last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we've got some great engagement uh, from, from some of our viewers who, who who are writing in with questions, with concerns, with with ideas on, on what we should talk about. And, you know, we talked about the Stanford Prison Experiment and how, um, you know, although somewhat inhumane, it taught us a lot about the human the human personality and the human mm -hmm. capability and the, the human drive, essentially, and, and how we can easily tweak uh, a person from, from a good person to an evil person or likewise, just by changing the environment. And then we talked a li little bit about the milligrams uh, Stan, stanley milligrams experiment and how you know by by the authority figures play such an influential role you know whether it's parents or whether it's teachers or whether it's corporate leaders right uh and and how uh we have this huge issue of the power distance index especially in developing countries like malaysia and last week we talked a little bit about uh something else right uh and 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 some some great uh, uh other other insights that we had um now this week we're going to talk about learn helplessness right is that is that, is that right, right andrea learn helplessness right. that's the term correct and so and uh in, yeah. and you see marissa's excited uh hey andrea hey, you know, marissa's excited to hear us um and and uh, looks like sashi is also excited to hear us and and we're going to talk about learned helplessness andrea what is learned helplessness <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's take a quick video before that, right? Uh, and then quickly explain to you in a minute what it is before we jump into an experiment that does this. Sashi, you want to pull up the video for them to watch? All right, let's let's watch. What is learned helplessness? Well, in India, when elephant trainers catch a baby elephant, they tie its legs with a rope to a post. And this baby elephant will struggle for days trying to break free, and it eventually gives up when it learns that it's useless. When it grows up, these trainers keep it tied using the same rope. And even though it's now strong enough to break free and escape, the elephant stands around waiting for the trainers because it's learned that it's meaningless. This elephant has developed what's known as learned helplessness. And this is the fact that despite having the power to change its situation, it's learned to feel helpless instead because of the past. It was identified by a scientist in the 1960s who do the same thing by shocking dogs. Highly unethical, of course. But what does this have to do with us? Well, in your life, you may have experienced a crushing defeat and learned that there's just no way to overcome it. Maybe it's not the case. Maybe that's just a story you've told yourself. Just think about it. If the average person does poorly on a test, they'll say the professor was too hard a marker. Whereas a clinically depressed person will blame themselves for not being smart enough. In both cases, the moment you give up, you've learned to be helpless of the situation. So in what ways has learned helplessness affected you? Okay. All right. All right. Cool. So, I think uh, Marisa, Marisa asked yes. the question, right? Uh, yeah, over yeah. The chat. So uh, let's, 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 let's uh, you ponder that. I mean, Andrea, what? Uh, is it the same? No, it's not the same. 
So vulnerability, you know, is basically being able to open up and share what you're going through. But learn helplessness as you watch the video, right? It's basically thinking that you're stuck in a situation that you've been conditioned to. So it has to do a lot with conditioning. So let me share with you a, a, an experiment, right? By the founder of this understanding of learn helplessness, Seligman. Um, he started off with um, learning, uh, doing experiments on conditioning with dogs. And he found something very interesting, right? So let's say this part, the first part he asked, like, you know, if you have three dogs, and in these three dogs, he puts in three different situations, right? So if the first dog, um, I think they put in, they're all in a cage, but they all were given different stimuli or things that will trigger them, right? So the first dog, they just hang out, which is the control um, dog at this point of time in the experiment, if you are familiar with the term. The second dog gets a shock, but it can stop the shock if it steps on the bar. And dogs are really smart. They learn how to do that really quick, right? But this third dog gets a shock. And when it, it doesn't stop, right? it doesn't help anything. It cannot get out of the cage. It cannot help itself. And there's no ability to control the shock. Now, what does uh, the experiment at, at that time in 1967, if I'm not mistaken, they found that this has taught the dogs to replicate the similar situations later on, even when there is no uh, shock or if there's a possibility for them to escape, it doesn't, right? So if you see the third uh, image later on, right? The first dog actually jumps out, escapes the shock because there's a place for them to get out. The second one escapes the shock because it knows that, you know, if I could step on this uh, bar and stop the shock, I wouldn't get reprimanded if I leave this cage. But this third dog that has nowhere to escape at that point of time, and when there was a place where they could escape eventually, it still stays there and just accepts it right so learned helplessness is really about being conditioned in an environment to think that it will replicate after right even there is no electrical shock or even there's a door right straight open up for them they will not go out and this is also seen a lot in like um, a lot of experiments revolving around kids um, as well as adults right um you think about abuse situations as well those are why they use this term a lot learned helplessness so to put it in a uh, brief summary, what learned helplessness is basically when you've been conditioned so much to think there's a repercussion and no matter what you do, you can't get out of it. When you are actually removed of that environment to put in a different environment that has an escape route or something completely different, like a, a no punishment place, you still think that you're going to get shocked or you're going to get punished or it's never going to change. Right. So that's that's how Seligman tested this out. And they started doing a lot of experiments more with humans as well. Of course, not shocking them, um, but uh, more and more ethical experiments uh, later on. So that's that's what pretty much learned helplessness is. Mm. And I think um, to tie in with today's topic, it's um, in, in regards to victim mentality. Right. I mean, boss, have you have you heard of this uh, you know phrase before, like um, victim mentality, victim mindsets? What do you think about that? Yeah, no, and and I, I think it's it's something that you know it's it's so common uh, that we sort of don't think about it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about uh, you know when, when you play sports, right? Um, I I I happens to me sometimes when you play badminton, and then you say, why can't I beat this guy? But I can. I'm so much better than this person. Uh, but we have this mindset that we can't, and then there's a block, right? But I also think sometimes things like overparenting, right? When we overparent, right? Um, and then what happens is there is this learned helplessness, right? The, the kids just don't know how to get themselves and untangle, just like that dog. And so they end up whining and complaining and, and getting upset. And in fact, it then hurts their relationship with the parent, right? Um, I and mean, you see that in the office setting, I mean, with COVID, right? Um, where where you, you had two choices, right? When, when it hit us, right? For us, for example, 90% of business just vanished overnight, boom, gone. And, and we're like, hey, we still have to pay the 80, 70, 80 people that we had in our office and so on. And you can sit there and whine, why? You know, it's one of those days, horrible, this and that. And, and then you ultimately just go into this uh, mode where you just are helpless. And this is where we call the powerlessness comes in. So basically, we are giving our power away to somebody. And that's what the victim mindset uh, essentially is, that, right? That I'm a victim and this is not my fault and all these things happen to me, blah, blah, blah. And over time, is I cannot do anything because nothing is in my control and so then i give the control away to the circumstance or the situation or the other person right and then just like that dog in spite of getting all that shocks you just stay there and 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 lull into depression and uh, and, and other issues so it's it's something that happens in 
companies, I mean, this is the, the thing that's very scary. It happens in companies so much, um, learned helplessness. And, and I see, you know, Anil's joined us um, and, and uh, Esther's joined us. Uh, also, you know, good to see you guys here. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also, I guess, hi, Sashi, good to see, good to see you too. I, I haven't seen, uh, uh, and, and, and Marissa has a question, I, I think, uh, before we go, how do we avoid learned helplessness in organization and culture? Um, Andrea, your thoughts? I think one way is to, like, we've talked about calling these things out, right? Culture, right? If we know that it is not a culture that is good for people, then to call it out. But I think maybe I can give a perspective more of colleagues, right? Um, employee, employer-wise, I think uh, Roshan can have a better perspective, perspective on that. But as colleagues, I think it's very important to really look around you, especially in virtual virtual situations, right? Checking in from time to time with people you work with is very important. I think just checking in and say, how are you doing? Um, you know, what, is there anything I can do for you today? I think that's just one big gesture that you can change on the ground as colleagues. And also, I think to look at the signs and symptoms um, instead of just saying that, ah, they're just blaming everybody, they're just complaining. Because learned helplessness is learned, right? It's not something that just happens like that. It's usually conditioned over time. And because they've been gone through, going through experiences that put them in those situations, then it becomes a powerlessness that is learned and conditioned. So I think, yeah, checking in with each other would be the most practical step as a colleague I think we should do. Um, I think Sashi does that all the time with me as well. He'll be like, how are you doing? And he'll just send me memes and gifs. I think that's very important to keep each other in check and look out for those signs instead of saying, ah, this person just likes to complain a lot. I think that's the mindset that we have to go with. Um, Roshan, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, and I, I think uh, Marissa kind of agrees with you, right? Checking with each other. But I mean, I think I think the other piece that we have uh, is that, and many of us may not really realize this, uh, is that our brain uh, is actually by default, uh, we always, we have this thing called the mind's eye. Uh, this is a, a spot in between our eyes and our brains, right? There's always scanning the right environment and looking for this and looking for that. Now, our mind's eye is conditioned uh, by default to be negatively skewed. What that means is that you are negatively, you're always looking for danger. You're always looking for threats. You're always looking for bad things. You're always searching for negative cues, not looking for opportunities, not looking for positive cues. So when a situation, you know, this and this is really how learn helplessness comes, right? When something bad hits us, when, you know, in this case, the, the dog getting, getting electrified and, and so on, right? When something bad happens, right? You know, we start to cue and say, oh, this is negative. And this is bad for me, right? And, and this negative, then we're looking for another negative thing. We're looking for another negative thing. And over time, we become so negative-centered that when the door opens and we have an opportunity to jump, we cannot see that opportunity because we become totally immersed in looking for threats. And if you don't believe me, you know, if, if, I, if there's something negative that happens to you, like this COVID hit us, you know, immediately, right, we are looking at all the threats that hit us and then if, let's say, uh, there is 10 opportunities out there and one threat, which is the COVID threat, we are so focused on that one threat and we completely ignore the 10 opportunities. And even uh, if, if I give you a, a performance feedback, uh, I, I bet you this happens to you. <laughs> I, I give you a performance <laughs> feedback. I'm like, okay, here is the 10 good things and your strengths and here's your one uh, development area and one one thing that you are focused on. Guess what? Andrew's going to focus. What's wrong? Why? 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 Did, why? 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 think I'm so lousy at this part? <laughs> and he gets so worked up. I'm like, dude, I got. I give you 10, 10, 10 positives and one negative, right? Um, it's 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 predisposed, right? And this is why it's hard sometimes. Learned helplessness is something that is probably you know it's something that is by default a, a, a piece that comes to us. So you know, in companies, right? And you look at it. When you say, oh, the boss is talking like this, the boss is this. Now, after a while, uh, I, I don't know, and this, uh, and this happened actually to me, really, it really happened to me about maybe six years ago, right? So I was, I, you know, our office is pretty open and people talk to me and they come to my office and, and talk, right? But somehow in town halls, right, nobody speaks up at all, even though they agree or disagree. And I was like, hey, I, I shared this and everyone said, cool. I mean, they didn't say anything, like, <laughs> so I'm assuming it's cool, right? So we go ahead with it, right? Then after that, they come and say, no, we cannot do this, blah, 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 and, and so I, all the nonsense. I say, why didn't you speak up? So I don't know, I don't know. And so as we started to learn, know what's to learn helplessness, because in school, when they were young, and again, this is Malaysian education system, I think, um, is we were beat by the teacher if we make noise and, and question the teacher and so on. So suddenly, we have this learned um, helplessness that, we must always be just submissive and listen, you know, whenever there's an audience and, and someone uh, is there talking. And, and all these things, right, uh, are something that 
actually it starts with this, you know. It starts with us redirecting ourselves, forcing ourselves to look for opportunity. And that's really how we untangle ourselves from this victim mentality. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I really like this quote and, 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 and Marisa, I think, uh, uh, reinforcing this, uh, saying that the brain is designed to look for risk and danger. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, the number one goal of the brain is survival, right? Yeah. Um, and we were built for survival. But today, uh, I, I, I mean, there's no snakes and dinosaurs and, and things popping up left, right, and center trying to eat us up, right? Uh, I, I just got a comment from Sheila. The use of people within your circle of influence to help and create an empowering environment. Okay, empowering, Sheila. Um, we'll correct the <laughs> English right there. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, to go there. So, you know, Sheila, Sheila, and, and, you know, Sheila Chandran, you know, thanks for being on the show. I mean, Sheila's a great example, right, um, of never allowing... Uh, the victim mindset, right? I mean, there, there are situations in her life where, where, where she, you know, could have been just said, "Look, I'm a victim. These bad things happened to me, and I'm like, I, I can't help it, you know. Uh, what to do, you know? And and just give up, right? But no, she's like, no. Let me look at the opportunities. Let me look at the flip side, and let me take advantage of the opportunities and disregard the threats, right? Uh, or mitigate the threats, right? If there needs to be a mitigation uh, of that, right? Um, and and you know, I like this. Uh, I'm going to share uh, uh, two quotes, uh, but but one I really liked um, is this. Um, quote by uh, Steve uh, Mar Mari, uh, Mar Maraboli, right, who says a victim mentality is a prolonged form of suicide. And, and you know, it, and, and Andrea, maybe you can comment on this. Um, it's something that slowly leads to worse and worse and worse and ultimately leads to uh, uh, depression. And, 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 you know, you, you reach a point where you just have no purpose and, 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 and meaning because you feel you're locked in a corner. And ultimately, you know, uh, and yesterday I saw this really horrible uh, image or a couple of days ago at least of someone who, who had hung himself um, uh, uh, in the middle of a highway and uh, it was it was uh, 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 kind of jarring but I mean I think you you know help learn helplessness over time actually translates uh, to that I mean your, your thoughts uh, Andrea yeah I think it's it's very true you know it slowly eats you up and you don't notice it because it accumulates and it gradually expands and expands and expands it until it becomes like a totality of what you think and how you will the view the world and you know it's very interesting because uh, some time ago when we were looking at the statistics on suicide you know in malaysia specifically the one of the biggest top five reasons why people kill themselves and you know choose not to live anymore is actually because they felt like they couldn't deal with whatever that's happening right so a lot of them were either um in, in depth a lot of depths and stuff like that or they feel like there is no purpose anymore there's no use to work and live and it's very scary also because i think uh during the pandemic the numbers have shot up really high um people started to feel locked literally locked in their houses and the situations that come with them so yeah i agree um it is a really prolonged um way to die and it will just kill you and kill every other thing around you so like it's, mm. it's literally a disease yeah. Yep. Yep. And you know, I, I, I've always, you know, whenever I teach, I sometimes share this quote by Adrian Davis. Now, Adrian Davis is interesting, right? Um, she actually lost her legs during the Boston bombing. She was running. She's, she's a dance instructor, and she was running the Boston Marathon, and there was a bomb, right? Uh, and, and you know, what, what I found was very interesting about Adrian Davis is this. You know, she, she says, look, I insist on being called a survivor, not a victim. A victim means I somehow belong to somebody, or I'm suffering because of him. I'm not suffering. I'm thriving. And and so you know when I when I when I when I when I read this quote by 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 her, um, I, I sort of said you know I think sometimes you know we we are powerful you know we have options we always have options you know regardless of how bad the hand that may have come on us we have options but what we do is we give those options up and that's what powerlessness is all about and and you know I I thought you know one of, one of my closest friends uh, um, is a professor of uh, of IMD which is a business school in the US. Um, and he wrote this book a uh, number of years ago, I think about maybe 15 years ago, or maybe even longer, um, a call Hostage at the Table. Um, and this guy, Professor George, uh, Professor George Cole Reeser. Um, and, and George, you know, we will bring him on the show one of these days, um, but we'll probably have to move the show to about 4 p.m. because he's, he's in Europe, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Lausanne, in, in Switzerland. Uh, but but uh, maybe we'll do that. Uh, but but George always tells me, and, and he's been, a, you know, he's, he constantly does, um, uh, workshops and, and, uh, and other educational things with us. And, and he talks about not just the power of the mind's eye, but how we go into the cycle of powerlessness. 
And I thought maybe, you know, and, and, and Sashi, maybe we can, uh, we can uh, show a, a clip of George talking about taking, being taken hostage. And here's the thing, you know, he says that sometimes it's not about a person putting a gun on our heads, but we are what we call psychological hostages, where even though there's no gun on our head, we get taken hostages by our children, by our spouse, by our bosses, by our, our subordinates, right? Our, our, our employees take us hostage sometimes. And he says that this is not that they're having a gun. And actually, we have power. It's just that we have gone into what they call learned helplessness, uh, giving our power away um, to others. So let's hear you know, a little bit from George um, before you know, we get some comments from Andrea and, 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 the, and some of you guys also. Roots of success are built around leadership and leaders do make a difference. They change the destiny of an organization, of a team, and of individuals as well as themselves. Behind leadership is one core fundamental idea, that of empowerment, to be able to act, to not feel helpless. And that brings us close to the whole idea around being a hostage. As a hostage taker, the fundamental goal is to be able to persuade a hostage taker to give up their weapons, give up their hostages, come out knowing that they're probably going to go to prison. That's a pretty massive amount of pain to ask someone to go through. And in fact, hostage negotiators overall get about a 95% success rate. Now you may ask, what's the connection to leadership? Well, there is a direct connection because what hostage negotiators do, leaders can also learn to do. And in fact, high performing leaders are never a hostage to anyone, anything, or to any situation. What it means is that you as a leader can be held hostage to a boss, to a colleague, to a situation, to a client, or in personal life, to children, to neighbors, to spouses, the list is endless. However, you can do the same thing hostage negotiators do, which is to influence and persuade around a benefit, and through that benefit, be able to convince someone to change their mindset. Now, what are the fundamental pillars of leadership? Well, number one, has to do with mind's eye. How do you lead from the mind's eye? And if you look, you'll see that we all have in our brain a focus from the mind's eye on either the positive or the negative. What is interesting is that the brain is in fact hardwired to look for the negative as a survival mechanism. However, great leaders must be able to find the focus on something positive. Look for the opportunity. And to understand that when you do that, you're actually playing to win. The sad story is this. The majority of people, somewhere around 80% of people, play not to lose. In other words, they're driven by their fears. They're held hostage to fears and beliefs. Instead of looking for opportunities, only about 20% of people actually play to win. And the question is, do you play to win? Does your team, team play to win? Are you focused on helping inspire a whole group to come together in organizations to be able to achieve something better than what they imagined? That's what high performance is about. That's what high performance leadership is about. It starts by how do you focus looking for opportunities and benefits and helping persuade others to come along in doing that. Well, you know, George is always uh, 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 exciting and always gives us a, a, a point of view that uh, um, that's very interesting. But you know, one of the things I think um, George postulates is that you know this this is something that is really about leadership, right? Uh, it's about us being able to um, being able to take ourselves and start getting gaining control. And I think you know, there's a question out there, you know, from uh, Mr. K. Seven who says, "What can we do if someone around us has?" the victim mentality. Um, 
So this is not just our person, but it's somebody else. Uh, and you're, what can you do uh, if you have a colleague or a friend or who's in such a situation? Yeah, I think I think the very first thing is always go with empathy. You know, like I mentioned just now, it's very easy for us to say, ah, this person is, you know, complaining nonstop, you know, just pick up the work and do it, lah, right? It's some, most of us get very frustrated when we deal with people with this kind of mindsets. And you'll see, like, if you search online as well, you can see all the traits of victim mentality. They, uh, they have a lot of self-pity, they don't have accountability, and it seems all very negative when you read it, right? But the truth is, like I've mentioned, you know, they come from a place with past traumas, past experiences, things that they've experienced before that turns them into that victim mindset. I'm not saying everybody is like that. I do know some people who have no past experiences and then they become, they, they absorb that belief that they are a victim all the time, right? But the thing is that when we approach people like that with um, empathy, right, we are being able to put ourselves in their situation. And it doesn't, it, it's never a harm to ask them, why do you think this way? Right? I think that's the first thing. Like, If we never really ask them why, maybe they never even realize that they have had this mentality with them. right? And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about a more practical approach as well to, to help us ourselves and see other people. And, and it's actually locus of control. But before I go into the nitty-gritty parts of locus of control, I do want to ask the people who are watching right now, right? Um, have you ever been held hostage or psychologically hostage by yourself? It might be very simple things like you think that you can't turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth up to a very big, um, you know, hostage situation where you feel like you can't, um, you know, climb up the ladder in your career, right? So, so just comments and I want to see if there's anybody out here who has gone through that before. Yeah. Um, and, 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 while, and, 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 you know, while, while, while uh, you put your comments out there, I think, um, Andrea, one of the things I find uh, 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 the extreme case of this uh, is uh, sometimes people refer to this as the Stockholm syndrome, um, mm. and you know one of well, I think one of the classic example of uh, learned helplessness is um, a lady called Bobby Parker, uh, who was kidnapped by a guy called Randolph Dial, um, and Randolph um, kidnapped her and in her home I think and put her there, and for about three four years you know she had abused her and he did all kinds of stuff to her, and then you know after a couple of years he started to be a bit more relaxed and he said look I want you to go take the car and pump petrol or, or put gas, you know, it's in the US, um, and come back. Um, and, and she went alone, you know, with the car to, to pump this petrol. And then, you know, a couple of days later, hey, can you go and buy grocery um, in, into the grocery store and do shopping? And each of these were times where she drove alone um, and she could have easily driven out of the house and, you know, gone to the police station or even, even if she was at the groceries could just back the, the the person or the manager and say, look, I'm being held captive and, you know, I need help and so on and so forth. But each of the time, she was so fearful of the consequence and she thought she was helpless, right? And and and, and this is, the, the opportunity just was not availed to her, you know, essentially. Even though all of us like, hey, you're crazy. I mean, she had an opportunity to, to escape, but to her, that was not available, right? Uh, it was an instruction. And because in the past, when she broke instructions, bad things happened. This one was an instruction, and she had to fulfill that instruction and honor it and come back, right? Um, and 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 that's the Stockholm syndrome, right? To some extent, I mean, there's there's versions of it. Of course, Patty here is uh, falling in love with the with the with the with, with the, the kidnapper and so on. But 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 I th I think that's kind of how sometimes we are, right? When we actually have windows of opportunity to escape from a situation or from an abusive spouse or whatever it is, right? Uh, we we sometimes cannot see because it's learned that this is the consequence if I do something. And just like the dogs, right? The triggers for the dogs uh, were, were, were indicators that after a time, like, hey, forget it. Lah. There's no way I can get out of there uh, because I have no control. Whereas the second dog had control, right? I mean, it's like I, whenever I press, I, I, I got it to stop, right? Um, and, and, and so, you know, I see some, some questions coming on. Uh, so keep, keep those questions rolling and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Andrew, I'd love to hear your thoughts also on, on the hostage, uh, uh, the yeah. Stockholm Syndrome, right? Um, uh, Esther, yes, unfortunately, when older adults that tell younger ones that they can't do this, that's because of age. So I, I think the question, uh, maybe maybe there's a follow-up question to it, uh, but learning happens at every stage in life. So age really is a determine what you can or can't do. I think this is a question, Andrew. I suspect it is a question. Um, <laughs> seems like a command, but it's I think it's a question. What, what are your thoughts on it? 
Um, I think I agree. Um, it is very easy for for people to just say it is a determinant, right? A, a certain situation or a circumstance, whether it's age or something else, you think that it is gonna be determinant of what you can and can do, unless it is a literal thing that you cannot do, like you can't, you know, drink at the age of things because it's the law. So that's a very completely different thing, right? Um, and and then you know when like you know, boss, you you mentioned about parenting right over like the helicopter parenting right it's something similar to that if you keep putting your kids in that situation you say that you can't do this you can't do this you can't do this um and if you do this you're gonna fail gonna fail gonna fail they're gonna grow up feeling like that and and you've seen that with adults who have that kind of childhood they grew up thinking that they have no control my mom needs to tell me what to eat my mom needs to tell me what to wear um you know i i can't go and work in a job that i like so i think yeah learning happens at every stage and age is a determinant for some things but not everything. And that's where you got to decide where, which things is allowed and not allowed to do. And I think coming back to the hostage, um, you know, Stockholm Syndrome as well. So basically, when I was thinking about this topic, it, it came to my mind that there are mainly three responses with your health in a place like this, right? Um, when you're held in a cage or a, or, a, or a place that you cannot escape, right? Um, and you are being trained to, to have this learned helplessness. There's always three... Um, exit pathways and the first one is of course the, the dog who stayed in the cage and that's where victim mentality brews and that's where learned helplessness begins and you feel powerless and even though there's a lot of doors that you can just you know get out of that situation you think there is no use right that's the key word you, you think there is no use you're still never going to be able to escape the second one is of course the dog in the second cage where there was some level of control and that whatever action the dog did there was a, um, a level of control where they can still escape or stop the shock. So when that opportunity opens, they just run out because they know if, if I have some sense of control here, I know that I can face whatever consequence if I choose to run out. And of course, the third one is where Stockholm Syndrome comes. It's very interesting to me, right? I think one idea is that we start to change the perspective to think that the cage is for your own good. This is something that people don't call out a lot. Because you, you will say, ah, you know, my parents know best for me. Or, you know, my boss knows what's best for me. Uh, they're asking me to do this because this cage is good for me, right? These shocks are good for me. Uh, they're going to train me to be a better dog or a better person. And then we become uh, illusion. There's a disillusion to think that you have control. Uh, but the control is basically based on what someone else is doing for me. And you think that's good and you born with the idea, born with the concept, you love it and you have loyalty, right? And you see this a lot in organizations as well. Why a lot of people don't leave the organizations is because they have this sense of loyalty. But when you look at the culture, when you dig deep into a culture, you realize, but that's a horrible, toxic environment. Why are you there? Then they're like, no, 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 no. You know, my, my boss really treats me really well. Or, you know, my colleagues, uh, uh, they give me healthy competitions and stuff like that. So that's, that's uh, just my reflection on the whole hostage uh, situations in Stockholm Syndrome. So the question is, what cage are you in and do you have control to get out of it? Hmm. Um, yeah. And, and, and you know, if you, you'd love to hear, you know, if you are uh, willing to share, you know, what cage you, are you in and, you know, potentially if we can, we can uh, put some support. But I think when you hear, uh, especially, you know, I see with younger folks, I mean, youths and so on, right, when you... When you see situations where, where, and I think these are some of the symptoms of what we call learn helpless helplessness, right? Is failure to ask for help or frustration or giving up very easily, you know, lack of effort, low self esteem, passivity, poor motivation, the procrastination. I mean, these are these are you know to me uh, some form of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, building blocks to starting process of learned helplessness. And then you also can can look at yourself and you say if you, you have, if you start using words like ah oh, it's going to be one of those days. Ah, uh, why? I mean, uh, you know, my boss is hopeless, and you know, you start you start using words that uh, uh, simply start to negate that. You know, you are indicating that you are putting yourself in a position where there is no uh, option or no choice. You are getting into this zone of victimization or what we call learned helplessness. Um, so, I, I I think you know the easiest way to get out is. Um, one of the easiest ways is to continue to monitor your mind's eye. But I think another way that, uh, Andrea, you know, you want to talk a little bit about is the locus of control, right? You want to share a little bit on that? Okay. 
cool. All right, so locus of control. Um, some of you who have read, you know, the, the seven habits of highly effective people, you know that locus of control is one of them. And this is done by uh, Julian Rother in the 1960s as well. Um, he, he created and understand this uh, for a lot of therapy. Um, a lot of uh, counselling, a lot of therapies uh, focus on this because it seems to be one of the easiest things on paper. Like you see, it's either internal or external and then you do it, right? So so basically, um, internal locus of control is saying that I have the control to decide what I do and I can control and I can make things happen, right? I can determine my future. So there's a key word here. You realise that everything is about I, right? I statements, Versus external locus of control, this is where victim mentality happens, a lot of uh, blaming, a lot of, uh, no, you know, it's, it's somebody else, it's my situation, uh, you know, the weather wasn't great, you know, COVID happened. Um, a lot of the things are external. It's out of yourself. Okay, so this, this is the basic understanding of locus control. Um, but over the years, when, when I started reading a bit more about locus of control, it's actually a bit more complex than that, right? And um, they did a research because... In 1967, you know, when this research came out, they said that people should have very good internal locus of control. But they realized that if you have too much internal locus of control, you blame everything on yourself. And that's also where victim mentality comes in. You'll be like, I wasn't good enough. I did this wrong. Um, you know, I, I was a bad child. You know, this is the one, one of the most heartbreaking things I've heard before. Uh, as a kid told me, I'm a bad child. That's why my parents abused used me. Uh, some of you, I think it's how ridiculous that sounds like, but for them, it's real, you see? Because you, when you start saying that I take control over everything in my life, you would think that even the weather is controlled by you. And because it rains because you are doing something wrong, you see? And and then, you know, when, when George uh, Corizas mentioned this, right? Influencing the people around you, um, finding opportunities of the people around you is where you have that balance. Because you know, in, in able to be able to understand what you can and cannot control, you got to sit down by yourself and start mapping it out, right? For example, I can control how much food I take, all right? But I can't control if I have a tummy ache. I can't control if I have lactose intolerance. But I can control not to take milk. You get what I mean? And when you pen these things down, and this is one of one of the practical steps that uh, counselors and therapists do, is start mapping this out and make it see your reality as it is, not as what you think or your worldview is. And it's very important to have accountability. I think some somebody mentioned here, I think it was um, Marisa, right? Marisa, you agreed with Sheila. You said that we need good people around us to call us out. That's very important. Accountability partners who will tell you, hey, hey, this, this is not the reality. You know, this is just all in your head. Now, this is the reality and this is how it is. So I think mapping those out will help you gain a clarity of what you can and cannot control, but how you can influence your external locus of control with your internal locus of control, if that makes sense. So yep. let me give you an example and maybe in a workplace, right? Let's say you cannot, um, you cannot control your boss's... Um, decision on who he promotes okay um, or maybe a project that he's supposed to let go and say okay the money is going to go here and the project's going to run now you cannot control that but you can internally control how you perform you decide okay i want to step up and take this role i want to be upskilled so that i become a good potential candidate for him to launch this project or what whatsoever all right but i also can influence the people around me who have the potential to do the same Right? Maybe I can work as a team. Right, If I were to influence somebody who's close to my boss and that person sees the work that I do, then he can put in a good word for me. Right, And a lot of people think this is manipulation. You know, A lot of people have this mindset that this is manipulating the environment. The truth is not. You're influencing according to what you know you can and cannot control and putting it in obviously in your good odds. So I think this is an example in the workspace. Um, but... I would say that based on my experience with people who very, have very high internal locus of control, um, where they take everything onto their plate and say, I control everything, they cannot see windows of opportunities. And this is the irony of this whole theory, right? Because we think that when we have good internal locus of control, we're going to be able to see what's real, what's not, and then take responsibility and accountability to it. And the problem is that it doesn't not it doesn't only affect successes it also takes on failures 
So people who have high internal locus of control, they will blame themselves for any failure that might like maybe 1% of their influence on it. And that's the problem, right? They take everything onto the plate. Yeah, so that's that's how you can also practically untangle what is real and what's not um, with other people, with your team even, and see what it is before you even jump and say, that's my fault or that's your fault and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's what inter- internal and external locus of control can be a practical yeah. tool for you to figure it out. So and, and, and I guess it goes, uh, it's very contextualized, right? I mean, sometimes it's, um, you know, internal, external, you need to, to, to swing uh, you know, right. between between them to manage because uh, overly uh, high on one 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 skill gets you in trouble, uh, as you so well pointed out just now. Um, you know, w- w- one of the things I, I think you know as I as I ponder uh, learning helplessness, I think you know where when we have a crisis, right? Uh, we always have two reactions. I mean, we can have two reactions. Uh, you know, we can always look at it. And I think this is motherhood stuff, right? People say, oh, in every crisis, there's an opportunity, blah, blah, blah. You know, but but I think what you, your point you make is that important. I think you need to be able to see that opportunity. Um, and you need to be able to, and, and this again goes back to us um, really, you know, looking at ourselves and being able to redirect ourselves mm-hmm. to see opportunities. And I think the more we do that um, for little things, right? When something small bad happens, you're like, oh, what's the opportunity in this? What's the opportunity in this? You know, then as we start getting bigger and bigger disasters and and and, and crises hit us, you know, we are more likely not to be perturbed and upset uh, and go into this uh, victim mindset. I, I like what Bruce uh, Bruce Lee says. You know, defeat is a state of mind. No one is ever defeated uh, until defeat has been accepted as reality. Now, on the flip side is, you know, when, when when you're defeated, I just defeat and move on and go to the next game, lah, you know. And if you keep fighting when you're defeated, it doesn't make sense also, right? But I think what his point is that you don't, you're not defeated, right? Uh, you just lost the game, right? The the defeat is at the end of your life, right? Uh, whether you 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 live the life as a victor or whether you lost, right? Um, so I think I think that that uh, that that that's a nice little quote. I, I, another quote from Billy Cox: uh, "You can't expect to be a victor if you are living with a victim mentality." And I think this is, again motherhood stuff. Um, but and, and many times we cannot see that we are in a victim state. Uh, right. I think this is the biggest struggle, right? Um, you know, it's easy to say, "Oh, this person is in a victim state," and so victim mindset and victim this and victim that, uh, or, or is taken hostage. But the hard part, I think, for many of us is that when we are in such a situation, it happens to all of us, right? Uh, myself included, right? Um, happens to all of us in different parts of our life, right? So we may be victoriously running an organization, but when you go back to your family and you're taken victim by your kids or the other way around uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so it can happen in different aspects. And I think it's really about how do you how do you have self-awareness? Lah? I think that's that's going to be the, the, the key. Lah. Um, you know, Andrew, as we wrap up this section, what, what are your final thoughts on the topic? Mm, I think it's... Sometimes you're not... You don't realize you're in a cage, right? I, I like um, symbolism and metaphors and energy. Sometimes, sometimes you don't realize you're in a cage. Especially if the cage doesn't have those, you know, uh, black metal railings. It's clear glass. Um, so I think my final thoughts on that is that if you see somebody is in that glass cage or you yourself, like you start knocking, like, hey, actually there's something in front of me and something is wrong, right? Reach out to people and talk about it. I think talking about it will help you see yourself from another perspective or see help other people see themselves from your perspective. Um, being reali- realistic about what it is and then, you know, figuring out how to untangle that mindset and mentality is very important. Um, yeah, so so you know, having a support system is very important, um, and and that's going to be very useful, not just in victim mindsets, but all the other obstacles, self deficiating um, mindsets and stuff like that will really be useful. So yeah, those are my final thoughts, Rosie. Very good, and and you know, I think uh, if you're a leader, if you're a CEO of an organization, and you're you're your HR head and, and stuff, you need to be start, you need to start thinking about how do you build the right infrastructure. Um, to enable people to collaborate, to enable people to talk to each other. But I think more importantly is to untangle themselves from this uh, side. And part of it is self-awareness. Part of it is connecting, uh, uh, building bonds with each other. Uh, part of it is, you know, and, and we, we sometimes talk about team building and and and, and, and uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I, I always love uh, one of the best tools I find uh, is Happily, right? Because employees can unleash by teaching each other. They can compete 
uh, and say, let me just run run it out. And 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 uh, and as I run, I can de-stress and figure out uh, opportunities. Uh, so that there's there's a lot to say, uh, you know, with regards to this tool. Happily, so I think you know, as we wrap up this show, I just want to show you know, I, I end with a with a short little video and happily. Um, and wish you all the best in your own leadership journey. Um, keep yourself psyched. Untangle yourself from learned helplessness. Uh, remember, there is always an option. Um, we just have to search for it. And even if it takes us a couple of days, a year or so, uh, there is always going to be options for us. Uh, and we just have to never be like that dog who just ends up in the cage, even though the door is right there. And all he has to do is to jump out of that door. So with that, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next Wednesday, same time, same place. We have a guest joining us next week, um, a fabulous uh, a psychologist who will be joining us. So uh, look forward to seeing you guys, 12.30 GMT plus 8 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Singapore time. Um, Are you ready to get started?